obviously in the and in vintage in the arena formats as well uh in the in the eternal format so a very well-rounded player so we have elliot on the right side playing what we call in melee is it blitz i was trying to actually uh relabel the deck myself and there's nothing that references wizards there, <laughs> there's no wizards archetype so somebody from mtg melee is uh watching us <laughs> yeah uh maybe we need a new archetype there playing against hugo leonardo on mono black offers uh like we mentioned the deck that won the last big modern tournament here on the legacy european <laughs> Series. And the card we're seeing on the battlefield right now is Sleep Cursed Fairy. Yes, it is not the standard blue-green cauldron combo deck. It is a god honest Sleep Cursed Fairy here, played in day two of Elvis Barcelona, followed by uh followed by a tutor, suspended now, profane tutor to be specific. Um again, not a sequence I would have guessed yesterday, but here we are. Sun counter down to two, and you know what I saw in hand? Wizards Lightning. Actual Wizards Lightning. Yeah, Elliot made day two at seven and two. Uh, obviously, his his uh, day two so far not not going all that great. But uh, as you mentioned, like making day two of a seven hundred person event is already a pretty big accomplishment. So still four rounds to go. You know, maybe he can squeak into uh, into at least top sixteen. Mm. And as as we mentioned before, uh, top 32 players still get they, that qualification for uh, the regional championship. So even if you're not making the top eight, uh, there is still plenty to play for. Yeah, and I have seen a lot of blue-red mages, like Merc-red mages, thinking about playing a wizard's deck with Tishana. But Elliot went a completely different route. Uh, and you, uh, I don't want to spoil too much fun because it's a gift that will keep on giving uh, when you see the cards that he has included in his deck, but it is a doozy. It is, it is beautiful. Can we just talk about how this swamp <laughs> kind of <laughs> looks like a like an island <laughs> or a plains? I don't know. It's like a yellowish at the bottom, but yes, it looks very islandy. If you are here for deck lists, uh, it is a closed deck list tournament. We're not going to be able to show you all the lists just yet. But as soon as the top eight is set, that's when we're going to publish. We're going to click that publish button on melee. Uh, and this is round number 12, so only three rounds to go after this one. Uh, so if you just hang out for a little bit, uh, you should be able to see this, the, the deck list in, in a couple hours. So I've got a question to you, Martin, as a Hall of Fame and a very experienced professional. Do you typically counter the tutor or counter the thing that's tutored? Do you take the risk even? It depends on the format. Uh, we were covering uh, Legacy and Vintage a couple of weeks ago, and there, you know, you can Demonic Tutor for a card like Tabernacle, for example, Ooh. which you're not going to be able to counter. So yes. if you are playing that Dredgevine deck, for example, you might want to use that Force of Will on the tutor. Uh, but typically in Magic, if your opponent in, you know, Limited, for example, is casting a Diabolic Tutor yeah. or in a format like Modern, uh, you typically want them to to resolve the tutor, uh, find that you know powerful card they want to try to resolve, and then spend the mana on it, and only then use your counter to to stop that. In modern, the cards that the mono black deck is typically going to be looking for, if they're not under tremendous pressure, they don't need to find a removal spell. They're going to be finding a uh, card in the Great Creator, perhaps the One Ring, like yeah, some, some, Red, of those, yeah. some of those cards that are going to give them uh, card advantage <coughs> or board advantage. Yeah, and see, we see Vodalian Hexcatcher slammed onto the battlefield. And Vodalian Hexcatcher, when you look at the wording of the card, says you may sacrifice a merfolk, not a wizard, a merfolk. So, oh my god. Oh, this is... Yeah, this is the... This is the downside of playing X1 creatures at the moment. Ren and Six and the Orcish Bowmasters are two of the most played cards in the format. So Wizards Lightning. So there's a lot of fairy stuff going on. There's a lot of wizard stuff going on. There's there's some merfolk, merfolk energies. But that was a that was a two for one trade here. Oh, not even two for one. Yeah, it's even worse. yeah, because Hugo still has a token in play. So Elliot has to spend two cards there to now have this one mana three three flyer. And so basically, we call it build your own dragon's ray channeler. Well, yeah. Attack for three in the air. Um, now, it has pseudo vigilance, one could say, because you can attack with it and untap it and block. So, that's a cool thing you could do. 
but if you're playing against Elliot, you see a wizard interaction, as we said, the metaphor interaction, and it's so hard to predict what the opponent might have. That's one of the overall reasons to play proactive decks in such open formats like Modern, because if you are reactive and you play against Elliot, like, how are you going to approach the game even? What are you playing around? Yeah. I think in general, these days in Magic, the threats are getting so much better that just playing proactive Magic and playing the threats rather than too many answers is the way to go in, in most formats. And putting the pressure on the opponent, make them have the answers. Yeah. There, there is sometimes this fine line, which I like to tread, which is play a proactive deck that can be interactive. Maybe not reactive, but interactive. I think Merktide is in this kind of sphere that you've got these aggressive, proactive draws, but you can still assume you more control your role if you would like to. Uh, Lightning Bolt is fam famously great at this because it can be used both proactively and reactively. Mm -hmm. So Lightning Bolt, classic card in that role. And the One Ring on the stack, uh, and I see Petty Theft, I see Flame of Anno, but it doesn't do anything against the one and only. Yeah, Spell Slider Sprite, great at countering uh, cheap cards, but not exactly the One Ring, and looks like it might resolve here. Yeah, and you spoke wow. about you so spoke about Koff as being a fair deck that just slams four drops, but sometimes some of the four drops just stick, and they run away with the game. And in this case, yeah, we see Snapcaster Flame in hand. Ooh, we're going to flame like draw to kill Orc in response, which is decent. Maybe Elliot can actually take advantage of the life loss and put the proper pressure on 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 Hugo. Because if you're not going to win on the cards front, and you probably won't, you have to just win the game to make it impossible to draw too many cards. And Elliot was responding to the activation of the ring, so Hugo Ooh. draws a card, plays a thought sees. Okay. That's for the viewers. We see double Steam Vents, Snapcaster, Brazen Borrower, and Wizard's Lightning. And we're not playing Historic, mind you. This is modern. I'll, I'll tell you that <laughs> uh, Elliot's also playing a Van Vendillion Click. Yeah. So his deck is full of fairies, full of wizards. Uh, there is some Merfolk action going on. Uh, Wizard's Lightning, obviously, that should give it away that your deck is mostly built around wizards. Uh, if you are playing blue, you are going to expect cards like Counterspell, which is also what Elliot has in his deck. And there was also this Wizard Synergy Counterspell, right? One blue-blue, but if you can control a wizard, it's just blue-blue. So that's another thing uh, that could be played, but I don't think is. And we're trading resources, and Elliot is the one untapping right now. You go at 15. Oh, a lad is the pickup. And Elliot does the classic, I mean, not the classic, but trick, where you hold the newly drawn card upside down, or the other card upside down, so you remember the cards which... that the opponent had seen. Mm. Uh, which is cool, because if you write it down, you have to keep looking at the notepad, but here you've got the immediate feedback. You know what the opponent has uh, seen. How important is it to protect such information, you know, playing the wrong land that the opponent has or has not seen? I mean, you can also just, if you want, you can leave the card, you know, on the table. Uh, face up, yeah. So that you don't have, nobody has to take notes. But obviously, this is, it's a high-level event. So if you don't have to give your opponent free information, you, you don't do that. Or not free information. It's free the turn when they cast the thought sees. Later on, you know, they have to write it down. But uh, I, I don't typically think about this too much, you know. Take a look at my hand. I'll I'll take my cards back. And then I'm going to start drawing in a normal way. I'm, I'm the type of person that, if I have cards upside down in my hand, that just messes up my brain more <laughs> yeah. than, you know, the, the information I'm going to give away. So I, I don't typically think about this too much. Oh, my Invoke God. Invoke Despair. <laughs> wow. Invoke Despair. A card you may not have seen for quite some time because you cannot really play it in standard. Uh, but in this particular case, it is Shieldred's Edict Draw 2. Now, interestingly, what you could do is you could, ah, uh, exactly, animate Mutavolt. Um, you probably have done this trick plenty of times, Martin, against Liliana of the Vale, where, you know, minus and you find Dry Rab, or you animate, yeah, a manland. But we see a response back. Well, that's March of Wretched Sorrow, which kills the Mutavolt in response. 
Yeah, and March of Red Sorrows is Black Lightning Helix, one could call. A very good way to stabilize against... Uh, oh, Flashing in Brazen Borrower. So Elliot is really protecting that Sleep Cursed Fairy, probably because every other threat is easily killable, while Fairy has Ward. So he yeah, puts a bit of a premium on it. Interesting situation here where Elliot decides to sacrifice uh, the Brazen Borrower over the Sleep Cursed uh, Fairy. Obviously, they, they both have flying, but uh, the important part here is that the borrower has one toughness so even if even if the borrower had you know slightly more power even if it was a 4-1 creature i think even in that situation elliot would most likely consider uh sacrificing that because he does know he's playing against uh four bow masters in hugo's deck so he doesn't want to keep x1 creatures around oh and i i think it was a second wizard's lightning as the pickup so we've got six six burn in hand against the one ring pinging you for one and curse on the battlefield it could get scary hugo actually choosing not to activate the ring there it's interesting to put more counters on it yeah. which would cost him you know more life but the idea of drawing you know two more cards into three more on my own turn uh, that is certainly very appealing to me now you can double activate the cable coffers right you've got two uh, uh, there on the left the players left uh, so that's four mana and four mana again. Shieldred with the ring up. And we will have to double Wizards Lightning Shieldred, unfortunately. Yeah. That does not feel good because that destroys the whole game plan of Elliot's. Draw two. I th oh. oh my god. Non <laughs> non targetable removal. Wow. It's a sacrifice effect. So Elliot's down to no board. He had to use those Wizards Lightnings to deal with that shield dread. Otherwise, you know, Hugo would be would be gaining too much life in combination with that one ring. But now there is the one ring on the battlefield. The clock is ticking. Can Hugo find something, either another ring to replace this one, to reset the counters? Can he find a way to gain life? Yeah, shield dread would be great for him here. Khan would be probably... Pretty good as well. You could even play Khan, animate the one ring and smash in. And put a clock on the opponent. Wow, okay. Okay, there is a Karn. Speak of the devil. So what do these mono black decks typically have access to? It's not like it's not like Pioneer where the mono green deck is just actual all one-offs. In modern you have such powerful sideboard cards like Leyline of the Void that you typically have some of those in your sideboard. But there is usually at least like 10 one-offs. So cards like, you know, Sundering Titan, Cityscape Leveler, uh, Chalice of the Void, Engineered Explosives. But what could be a card for this situation? Maybe, I'm not sure if there's any mana floating. Maybe thing. another one ring, maybe? And just replace the ring? Yeah, so Coffers was activated. I think there's an Urborg in play, which means that there's still four mana floating uh, for Hugo there. So with the four swamps that are on tap, worm coil engine is that the is that the pick? Maybe walking ballista. Yeah, I think he wants to get the game over with. Uh, draw three, another Khan, another swamp. Yeah, Alice is really far behind right now. Oh, for mana tapped plus four ballista. That closes the game really fast. It's a really great sink like when you create these copious amounts of mana. Draw Flame of Anno in hand in, in subtlety, I think. Uh, Flame of Anno, unfortunately, cannot deal damage to Planeswalkers, which is probably a very purposeful design thing because in Lord of the Rings, there were not, uh, there were not any Planeswalkers, so it wouldn't make sense to have that text. Okay. Draw. Uh, yeah, I think I think Elliot is really far behind right now. Attack you. We can put a bunch of counters on it. Uh, but yeah, we're flaming. Just one mode, though. Destroy an artifact. Yeah. And four to you, down to seven.
Yeah, so Flame of Arnok has three modes. Draw two, destroy an artifact, or deal five to a creature specifically. If you control a wizard, you can choose two of these modes. Well, there's the Worm Coil oh. engine. So Huga finally finds a way to start gaining some life back. I like the fact that, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Worm Coil, a bane of interactive decks mm. uh, existence for how many, just so many years now. Yeah, this is the type of matchup where if the game goes long, you have to favor Hugo because he's going to have mana advantage thanks to a couple of coffers and Urborg, and his cards are going to be uh, yeah. more powerful. If the game, if Elliot's able to muster a very fast draw, uh, backed up by a counterspell or two, he might just be too fast for Hugo. But in this game, Hugo certainly had all the all the right answers. Uh, and uh, yeah, the proper payoffs. So now that they're wondering is the pickup. You know, because Elliot is now, you know, he might be drawing now spells of the sprite of the top. You know, a wizard's lightning, which are certainly pretty, pretty bad in this instance. Okay, All right. the ring gets reset. Yeah, so. classic trick. I think I think if you're Hugo, you want to stay at that seven life. Uh, I would very likely not activate the one ring now because you know you can still die to two lightning bolts plus the one life loss from the one ring. Uh, so it doesn't even come to that. Elliot draws and scoops the game so who go up a game uh we do have also a backup ready i saw some people in the chat discussing blue white control we do have blue white control uh ready as a backup feature match for later on in the round uh, yeah and is... in the nine and two bracket even mm. not even a draw not even a draw impressive for yeah but that's in the hands of of tsp Jendrick, who's okay. you know the fastest blue white control player in the wild west so I do not expect any draws. It's actually his, it's one of his personal goals not to have any draws playing blue white control. And so far, yeah, he's been killing it. The, the problem is that sometimes it's just, it's not up to you, right? There's, I mean, there, there is two players required to play a game of magic. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, your opponents are maybe not used to playing against control. So they're thinking through all their decisions. And, you know, that combined with the fact that control decks typically. Uh, Close do not play up, yeah. A lot, yeah, they do not play a lot of finishers. Like sometimes the games just take too long. Yeah, and now players are sideboarding. So Elliot has got access to multiple different tools. Uh, he might add a bit more counter magic in to stop these payoffs from, from actually resolving. Yeah, you certainly want some hard counters. Like Spell Starter Sprite is going to be good on the play. Uh, or in the early game to counter cards like Thoughtseize. Uh, but given that this is a deck that plays a lot of four... Uh, four mana cards, uh, you know, Spellster Sprite's not going to act as a hard counter. So in the sideboard, uh, you definitely want to look for more cards that can actually counter a card for good. Uh, even a card like Mystical Dispute could could, could potentially Ooh. be okay just because you want to... Have uh, a mana leak? You know, yeah. So have like an expensive mana leak that can stop the One Ring, that can stop an expensive March, you know, something along those lines. Yeah, and I... Th yeah. Hugo is already shuffling up. Now, it is considerably easier to sideboard with coffers when you've got 10 one-offs yeah. and just, just a couple of possibilities. It's very easy to map out the games where you don't sideboard at all and where you do sideboard, you probably just know. Three ley line in, three march out. That's it. We're good. So the sideboard guy for mono black coffers uh, will be pretty short and sweet. All right, let's let's give our chat a little bit of a trivia question. Ooh, okay. Uh, we're watching Modern. Do you know, according to the latest data, obviously this might change with uh, the bands, you know, who, who knows, but before the bands, what is the most played Modern card? What is the most played card in the Modern format, you know, according to the latest data? I can say that this is unguessable. That's... Uh, I wouldn't say it's unguessable, but it's there is something very interesting about it, that's for sure. Okay, we've got a couple. Oh. Wow, everybody just just straight up knows. Yeah, it's it wow, is, okay, it, it is Chalice of the Void, which which is interesting because that's a sideboard card, right? This this is not Legacy, where you have these like red prison decks that are trying to put Chalice for one into play, you know, with the help of Ancient Tomb or City of Traitors or Simeon Spirit Guide, you know, something along those lines. Uh, this is a format where Chalice is just a sideboard card, but I guess there is so many, you know, card decks, and it's a card that you really want to have against the Cascade decks 
uh, like Living End, like Rhinos, that it is actually somehow uh, presented in, I think, more than 50% of the, of the deck lists. And the third most played card is actually Engineered Explosive. Another, Ooh, that's an, my favorite. Another, uh, okay. another sideboard card. Good morning, good morning, chat. It's 11 o'clock here in Barcelona. And we're playing round 12 of the day two of the 700 person tournament. Just 64 players battling it today. And Sleep Cursed Fairy on the battlefield immediately on the very first turn into Tapland Pass. And remove that stand counter, shall we? Canal Pass. I would, I would really be interested in talking to Elliot and asking why he chose this deck over Murktai, because he has to see some angles, right? The matchups where this lines up just better. I think spell status sprite lines up perfectly against Cascade, for example, right? Mm. You can just counter the spell easy and you get a body, right? I think Elliot just, just likes playing, you know, his own decks or something that he may be brewed up and, and there's also some value in that. Maybe you have more fun playing a deck that is uh, a little bit different or you value the surprise factor that, I mean, your opponents are certainly not, not going to expect spell stutter sprites and, and cards like that. So I think there is a lot of value in that as well. Oh, and now we have the Sunken Citadel uh, activating coffers with Urbork in play. And now we see a Force of Negation, which just couldn't possibly <laughs> be faster. He doesn't even know what to pitch yet. But he says, you know, I I'm countering. But give me a moment. And we pitch Vendillion Clique. Wow. Okay, what a sequence. Untap Counterspell is the pickup. Bash for three. Down to 14 he goes. Yeah, and now El Elliot just wants to sit on a Counterspell or two. I think there's another Force of Negation in his hand. I think there's a Wizard's Lightning and a third card. So if he's able to stop the next two spells that Hugo plays, he's going to be in a very, very good position. But we do know that there are also sort of free spells thanks to March of uh, Drowned Sorrow that uh, Hugo can try to squeeze in, uh, also gain some life back. Although Ward is going to make that a little bit harder. And right now... Oh, we're marching. But in order to kill a fairy, you have to march... Like, pitch one or two cards and then pay the ward, which is just such an expensive price to pay, which shows... Okay, yeah, so let's fail push then. And much cleaner. Uh, although he's already revealed the march, which Elliot can take advantage of. And Elliot, he doesn't have an answer, but he might be just posturing, maybe in, in like a spell piece or I another think, form. I think there is a force of uh, that's, negation. In that's Tishana. Oh, is it Tishana? Okay. Or at least I think it's Tishana. So he... I mean, he's certainly thinking about it. He's giving it a, a proper thought. Oh, okay. he, he, might, he might just counterspell, right? And he does. He does okay. have the actual counterspell, okay. A card that it was deemed too powerful for the format from 2011 for like the next 10 or so years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he decides to show up in like w two decks. Okay. Oh, okay, chat. Question number two. How long has Counterspell been legal for actually in modern? Because it feels like it's been, you know, it's been unbanned six months ago, but I think it's going to be like three years now, maybe, maybe even more than that. Yeah, that's true, that's true. The, the thing I do know is that I've been playing it the moment it became legal. That's what I know. Oh, Modern, yeah, right, you're right. Since Modern Horizon was printed because it was in that set. Because that would be kind of weird to print a card that wouldn't be it legal in the format. Yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Attack you for three. Um, and we've got Tishana in hand. So if there is the one ring, he's got that covered. If there is a card, he's got that covered. So it has to be Damnation specifically here. Add mana. I can see Leyline of the Void. Yeah, Le Leyline is the type of card that's great when you draw it in your opening hand, uh, but not as much if you have to cast it uh, for four mana sometimes during the game when your opponent has already used their graveyard. Also, in, in this match, what are you trying to stop your opponent from doing with the Leyline? I think he might pu put Elliot Snapcaster on. Mage. Yeah, I think he might put him on like Merktide Snapcaster thing. Mm. Because he doesn't know the deck list, right? right, right he right. just assumes it that, might be Merkt ID. And this is exactly what, what we were talking about. If you are playing Boop. a deck of your own creation, 
uh, your opponents are not going to know exactly what you're playing. They might be sideboarding wrong, and they, you know, then they might not have a good idea of what exactly you're doing. All right, walk us through this. Karn into... Minus. Tishana, counter the minus. Blank Karn. And now we know... Okay, this is pretty cool because you're pitching Leyline, which is otherwise dead, to March. So that's a way to convert it. The same with Living End, which converts the dead Living Ends with Grief. And so now he goes up to 12, looking at 6 power on the battlefield. I swear to God, there is a force of negation that looks exactly like the Tishana. There is. Yeah, there is, there is, there is. Yeah, you're right. That's why I was confused. You, you're confused? Yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. They look... How is this not the same card? <laughs> yeah, they look awfully similar. Like the same colors even. Shades of orange. All right, back to Elliot, who's now going to be able to untap the second fairy, smash, probably killing the Karn, put Hugo to 10. Yeah, split the difference. One mana tapped. Okay. Another okay. fairy. Oh, and let's see if there is... Oh, the one ring is the pickup. That's probably the best pickup. Yeah, and the one ring is such a ridiculous card. Like, not only does it fit into every... Like, compare this to Jay's The Mind Sculptor, a card... <laughs> That was also too powerful for even standard. It was banned in standard, it was banned in modern. Yeah. And now we have a card that costs the same mana, essentially draws the same amount of cards. It can't bounce anything, but it gives you essentially a time walk and it fits into every deck. You can get it with car and like, how ridiculous is that? And to, to add to that, he, pay, he used two lands to play it. Literally two lands mm. have been tapped to play the one ring. So this... Uh, yeah, that's pretty impressive. So these are the moments where the Mono Black Coffers deck really shines, right? So we say it's a mid-range deck, it's pretty clunky, but the moment it pays two lands, uses two lands to play the one ring, it stops being as clunky and becomes pretty punishing. Uh, one could say it's like 2023 Zoomer Tron, or Zo tron ish kind of approach. Do you think this deck would work without the one ring? Or would you just not have enough... Uh card draw, would you just not, you know, be able to buy yourself that extra time with the ring? Do you think this would just not be possible? If I remember correctly, it was played before the one ring. But, but the... certainly not as successful. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, certainly. It was mm. like tier three. Uh, but here you can, you know, argue it's solidly tier two, one and a half-ish, because, you know, it does appear on the top tables. It won the last uh, Sofia event, so... It had, if you are just joining, it had a 50% conversion rate from day one to day two. 50%, which yeah. is Which is very high for a modern deck. Right, that, that's a defense grid, wow. Yeah, actual defense grid. And, uh, yeah, and then we draw the cards. Uh, we've got a very good comment here, but by Havai, who mentions that design-wise or aesthetics-wise, these blue cards or Z cards very often mishmash orange and blue because of, you know, blue is blue, orange, red, you know. Uh, it's, it's very often used. They are the opposite sides of the color wheel. Um, yeah, so now we have nine power against nine life. It doesn't matter because of the fog has been deployed. Okay. Add a million mana again. I, I can see a thought seize, a push, a sh ah, was that a shield it? Oh my god, that's oh, oh that's a big march. There's a f oh, there's a force of negation. So he he forces the opponent to pay the ward cost, and then counters, uh, but he can't because there's a defense grid. Oh, no, because he pitched the card. Okay, so you pay it for three, and they pay the three that Defense Grid requires, and you're all good. Which is a steep cost. So it, it costs Elliot an, an extra spell starter sprite, but he was able to uh, deal with the march. Resolving the march here would just be uh, a very nice way for Hugo to <laughs> you know, gain a lot of life by himself oh, no! even more oh, no! time. He pushed... And I think he couldn't pay the ward because he miscounted mana. He just died. Wow, who got Be nine? Yeah, that's it. Because one, he one, okay. Because he overpaid for March to gain life. Then he was met with a counter spell. Wow. Yeah, that was an interesting spot. Like how much 
extra mana do you want to invest into the war? Like, obviously, you want to gain a bunch of life, but at the same time, you also want to be able to, to resolve multiple spells, possibly, against wow. a deck with, with counter spells. So, Elliot with a the counter there, and uh, that's enough. But if you put yourself in, in Hugo's spot, you see the opponent has three mana, but you've got the defense grid. So it cannot possibly be an actual counter spell for mana because you, couldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to pay the three. So it has to be force plus blue card, right? So do you even play around? Uh, I think you just start with the cheaper spell. That's, that, that's a good one, yeah, yeah. Start with the Fatal Push, see if that resolves, yeah. and how much mana do you have left over to, to try to do other things and gain as much life as possible without dying if they have a counter. Yeah, very good insight by Martin. Use the Hall of Famer in the booth here. And players are shuffling up, and Elliot is doing what you said, which is potentially fake resideboarding. Unless he's actually reconsidering his options, he has seen a, maybe a bit more of the deck, but no. So let's say you're Elliot here, yeah. and you are playing this like relatively aggressive uh, blue-red deck or mid-rangey. You're on the play now, and your opponent is taking advantage of the fact that they have, you know, Urborgs and Couple of Coffers and gain, gaining a lot of mana thanks to that. To resolve cards like March of the Drowned Sorrow, you have a Blood Moon in the sideboard. Would yeah. you consider bringing that in? Obviously, against a deck that's playing, you know, 16 Swarms or something along those lines, where it's not going to really stop them from playing spells, but it's going to stop a certain part of their deck. Would that be something uh, that would interest you? I think it would. I think it would, especially as it also shuts off all the Field of Ruins, so they cannot mess with my mana, and they cannot filter their own mana. So that's one thing. But yeah, I, th I think I would highly consider it. I would s certainly consider Alpine Moon as a very cheap one-shot way to shut off mm. the, the synergies. So that could be really good if there isn't any, if there is an Alpine Moon available. Do you think it is worth the cost of, you know, paying a card for that because it's not free that's true you have to invest a mana into this and th and this is not a ma uh, a card and pay mana into this and this is not a format like legacy where you know if you draw the blood moon later in the game and it's kind of not very useful at that moment you can just play a brainstorm you know put it back on top shuffle it away this is a format where if you draw a death card uh, there's not a whole lot you can do to turn that into something better yeah there is no ledger shredder to to cycle through right, it for yeah. example uh, well, you can look at the Alpine Moon as kind of a defense grid for him because it, uh, it makes Hugo unable to multi-spell in a very weird way. Mm. So maybe you see it as, okay, one mana, you know, uh, rule of law or something, kind of, you know, asymmetrical rule of law. I think I would be much more to consider a card like Blood Moon in a deck like Murktide. Uh, although I'm not sure that really matters in that matchup as much, because in that deck, as you mentioned, I'm going to have Ledger Shredder to potentially cycle that away if it's not useful. Um, it's not a card you can pitch to Force of w uh, Force of Negation, for example. In the in the Merc deck, that you have more card selection. You have this Dragon's Rage Channeler. You have these triggers, Mishra's Bobble, Expressive Iteration. So I'm going to have more ways to find it as well. Uh, here, I think Elliot's kind of just at the mercy of, of uh, you know, the cards he's going to draw from the top of his deck, and he doesn't have as much card selection. So I think I would be less likely uh, to bring it yeah. here. But it's it's certainly an, an interesting debate uh, and one that, you know, doesn't doesn't have a clear answer, I think. Yeah. Yep, fully agree. And we are drawing the opening hands, and I don't see the turn one fairy, so it could be a pretty slow draw. I see Snapcaster Mage, I see Flame of Anno, Actually, double flame and Tishana. So, Elliot with this hand might be forced to just go uh, ambush Viper on turn two and then try to ride it to victory. So, if I'm Elliot, I am looking for counters. I don't necessarily need to have a super fast draw, but I want to have a couple of counters to stop my opponent's one ring, to stop their Karn. And other than that, if we're training resources, I'm fine with that. And this hand has neither, because it doesn't have a clock or counter magic, I think. So this is like a spell, a cumulative keep with turn to ambush viper into wood, flame two modes, flame two modes. There is Tishana, so that that protects you from the mm. wandering and Khan. So that checks out a lot. Also, interestingly, if there is a shield red, which is the last possible four drop, there is this draw trigger that loses you to life. You can respond to this by Tishaning it and then shots of shielded completely. Now we see Sunken Citadel adding two mana to activate land abilities. Field of Ruin you immediately. 
and screw with your mana a little bit. I have to say the Citadel has been very impressive in this deck. I mean, you obviously want to play as few non-swamp lands as possible because you're not going to have Urborg every game yeah. and you are playing a couple coffers deck. Uh, but Sung and Citadel has been very impressive here uh, so far. You know what I want to see? I want to see mana flow to this canal into play snap turn one now. Mm -hmm. Assuming heat floated. But this is a classic. Like, we just float usually, right? I think, if, I think if I'm Elliot here, I just want to keep my Snapcasters. I just want to play a value game where hopefully, you know, I'm going to join to a counter spell at some point. Then I'm going to want to uh, flash that back with Snapcasters. So rather than play a 2-1 and, you know, start a slow-ish clock, uh, I would rather play for the long game and for the, okay. for the value. Okay, yeah. So this also shows you that different players can have, have a different approach and hence different decisions uh, with the same hand, with the same deck, mm -hmm. right? You can just take different routes. Uh, some decks are a bit more linear. You play right to left, you know exactly what to play when. But with these types of decks, you know, I would play differently. Martin would play differently. And this is ideal for, for Elliot. Land go, land go, land go. That's perfect. Elliot kept a relatively slow hand, but, you know, a value hand with... Uh... With the Snapcaster, with the Flames, <laughs> he does have he does have answers for Shieldred. Uh, I'm not sure if he picked up a Counterspell in the meantime or not, but as 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 long as he's able to stop the One Ring or Karn, uh, he should be in a good spot. And I, what's cute is that he played only Islands, which basically means that Field of Ruin cannot be activated. Um, so yeah, I, that's I, cool. I like playing another playing uh, around another field here by not exposing the. I think only red source that Elliot has in his hand because he does want to be able to answer a shield red. So if there is a shield red, he, he's going to drop the red source next turn, play the flame. Uh, and I, I think I may have... Uh, yeah, I, I don't think there is Tishana actually. So he might have to use a counter spell. Tishana will be much, much better here uh, because he's have pressure. Yeah, I think using, using a counter spell here is very appealing because next turn I'm going to have the fourth land and that would allow me to play a Snapcaster Mage and flash back the, the counter spell. So it plays exactly into Elliot's curve, even, yeah. if, even if he's not able to use all three mana, uh, he is able to stop that and line up the Snapcaster for next turn. Yeah, so when you see three islands on Elliot's side, you might start approaching the, the point where Field of Ruins become actual Stone Rains. Now, we do know that there is one more island there, but after that, those Field of Ruins will be Wastelands. And it does come up, like when you play with these very long games against like uh, Field of Ruin, Blue-Eyed, or Mono Black, Mono White, they can run you out of lands. They actually can, and yeah. it's really annoying. I wonder if Elliot plays any actual mountains, because you're typically not very incentivized uh to run mountains, because if you have non-basics in play against Blood Moon, then you do have a mountain that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. usually you want to play the other basics in your deck, uh, which in this case are islands. So there is a chance Elliot just doesn't have a mountain. Although running one is typically a good idea. There are aggressive decks in the format. Sometimes you want to start, you know, Scalding Tarn, get a, get a mountain, kill your Wadna Cattle. Uh, I guess we're going to find out here. Oof, that's very aggressive sequence. So we've got Field of Ruin pop, respond to Shana. Field of Ruin pop, respond to either the land, a double stone raining um, Hugo in a way, but exposing yourself to a four drop payoff. But there is no four drop payoff. So that's really good for Elliot. No March or Tide, on Tide Binder. There is force of negation. I think you're right, um, unsurprisingly, but I think you're right. Elliot can win this game uh, just just on the card advantage front. Yeah, just just, just full just grip, taking things slow and and you know using cards like Snapcaster Mage to get value, Flame to eventually draw some extra cards while answering a Shield Dread. I think this is this is a game that Elliot wants to play rather than trying to be super aggressive against a deck that you know shown to have. Fatal Push, Shield Red's Edict, multiple, um, multiple marches. Oh, that's not the best possible top deck, probably, Urborg. Because otherwise, Cabal Coffers just added two mana. Now it has five. 
That's a big difference. But yeah, as, as we said, you know, the Kofis player, two for one himself with March, mm. while Elliot is, is, is up on cards all the time. Wow, and Hugo has to pass the turn, so his hand is probably just stacked with removal. <laughs> yeah, t turn seven, ferry. You know, a threat. Suspend three, you know. But then if, if Hugo does nothing, you can just double activate it, untap, untap, remove stun counters. But with floating a million mana... Okay, now be careful with the <laughs> ward ability. Yeah, yeah, we, we've done that before. Shoot for three, ward, pay. That's a five mana removal spell. Or even more, six mana. And then it's, uh, Elliot says, yep, okay, <laughs> that resolves, that's okay. No biggie. And Hugo is at 26, so yeah. it, it has to come down to a long grindy game. Yeah, and right now, this is not a fight that Elliot's would want to, want to fight. Uh, he doesn't want to play a Snapcaster here to flash back the counter spell and fight over a Drown. He doesn't care about the 3-3. Three, three. He knows that if the game goes long, he's going to be able to find some ways uh, to start pressuring Hugo. Oof. But for now, uh, all that he needs to, all that he needs to do is stop the one ring from from resolving. I really like the patience of Elliot. You know how conservative he is. Like he knows his role, and he's like, "You pass back, okay? That's okay." And he just, just again gasses up, makes his land drops, draws more cards. Ooh, and what do we see? See here in the year 2023, spell started sprite and clink to dust. It's from like the, the eighth situation that I didn't have on my bingo card. Clink to dust is very important here though, because now Hugo has access to potentially uh, respond to a snapcaster and eat the target, but decides to use it, flash it back or evoke it or what's the escape it, escape it, escape it right away. Okay, it did resolve. It's a counter spell, so that's that's a proactive way to disrupt a potential Snapcaster. Uh, Orkish Bowmasters. Well, I'm curious if that was the draw because if it wasn't, you could have flashed it back in response to spells that a sprite, um, because it checks on the resolution how many fairies you control at that moment. Uh, but then Elliot would have been able to activate Mutavolt in response to up the number of fairies and still resolve the trigger as he as he wanted. So a lot of things are happening here even if we don't see them. Uh, but he's still considering what to do with this Orkish Bowmasters. He could, for example, Tishana stifle the trigger. Uh, but he, uh, he's got Force of Negation, so he could go like... Flame of Arno two modes and hold up alternative cost force of negation, maybe? A lot of options for Elliot there. I just I just want to give a give Elliot a shout out for running the old the old uh Euro land. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Venice basics, the Venice Islands. Okay, we do see Flame of Arno double mode. Beautiful islands there. What's your favorite island? Yeah, probably this one or or um, on uh, what's what is Un it? Unhinged. I think unhinged. Uh, unhinged. Unsanctioned. Un unstable. Un un unstable. Unstable. Unhinged. Unstable. Unglued. I think are the some of the nicest lands. Obviously, beta. You know these lands, the the gore lands, but sometimes hard to get. All right, there's a shield dread. I think Elliot still has another flame in head though, so that's not not going to be too big of a deal for him. Also, I think still has that snapcasters. Uh, yeah. snap, snapcast in hand. Yeah, but yeah, Elliot will again kill draw two, and he's like up three cards at this point, and he's soon to be like up five. Um, so this also shows you the difference in approach and that it can change mid-game, because we literally discussed Elliot being potentially the aggro deck in this matchup, but now he's like, well, let me be the control deck. And he navigates the game in this fashion. Activate Mutavolt, kill the Mutavolt, responds to the final push with double flame of honor mode. Oh, that's painful. Wow. Yeah, and th 
this is very valuable as well like having a deck that can switch gears off your sideboards like game one game one you present yourself as a relatively aggressive you know wizards lightnings uh spell starter sprite uh the three three Fair, fairy yeah. four one mana uh you are presenting yourself as an aggressive deck uh your opponent might want to you know add a couple more fatal pushes some extra removal spells while all you do is add some more counter spells to make sure the one ring doesn't resolve and you're just playing a slow game where yeah i mean you have a lot of removal you have that stuck in your hand i'm gonna just develop my board uh with lands draw some cards in the process you know make sure that the ring doesn't resolve and then just uh kind of take it from there yeah and we've got just two cards for for hugo with like a you know, seven cards for elliot Oh, Khan on the stack is going to be? Do you Tishana the trigger or do you force the Khan? I think Elliot has so many cards that he can just afford to play the fours here and stop the Khan if he wants to. But also, playing Pressure. the Tishana is very reasonable here. Uh, but it is, it is uh, possibly bad against removal, which I think is very likely to be in Hugo's hand. But then you force the removal... And basically, Hugo is is on empty. That's true. You can do that. And now that the orc is tapped, uh, you can force the march and then attack the Karn for lethal. But there, I think there's also still a mutavolt. No, the mutavolt's dead, actually. Yeah, he was fatal pushed, yeah. All right. Well, so Hugo, no cards in hand, but he does have a planeswalker. And I don't think Elliot's going to be able to attack it, but he does Ooh. have a full hand. There is a bolt, I think. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. clean. That's clean. Woof. Yeah, that, that that is rough. But mind you, there are four minutes on the clock and Elliot has to actually win the game. And deal 27 damage. Yeah, That's he... not going to be easy, yeah. I think he's considering, like, yeah, just playing creature. Uh, it will be like flame, maybe. Kill your creature, draw two, and gas up back again. Elliot's deck has a lot of one and two and three power creatures. Uh, so this might take a while. Like, there's nothing like a shield dread that would suddenly, you know, put the opponent on a very fast clock. Yeah, three minutes there. Alternative cost, force of negation on cling to dust, crucially exiling it as a part of the resolution. Uh, and we just need uh, 14 attacks. <laughs> Just 14 attack, <laughs> no big deal. Another flame gets played. Clears the side of Hugo's board. Ooh, Vendillion Cleek. Oh, look at that pace now. Elliot's deck feels like you found a blue-red fairies deck at home from 2009 or 2006. And you're like, oh, what can I add to this deck? Can I make it playable, you know, still in, in this format 15 years later? As it turns out, you can. <laughs> yeah. Double land for Hugo, including attack and Numa. Now it's five power, so just five attacks is probably enough. Which is which which is much more reasonable. Like much more reasonable. Five attacks in three minutes. Yeah. But let's see what he can do with the Takanuma here. Mill himself a little bit. Yeah, uh, Bowmaster's killing click. Always oh. bring back the Bowmasters. That would shorten the clock considerably yeah. again. And let's see if that resolves. Okay, you kill it in response. It's another flame. Two more cards for Elliot. Well, Force of Negation not going to be able to counter the... Oh, but but with the draw of Flame of Honor, I think you can tr trigger Bowmasters again, essentially wiping the opponent's battlefield. Uh, and I think this is exactly what they're discussing. And if it is the case that Elliot loses both creatures, I think it will have to end in a draw. Oh, we'll find out soon enough. Oh, so Master fully played, but can't close the game. And we do have a 3-3 three, three army. Nine life for Elliot. Maybe, maybe Hugo can take it down now. Oh, yeah, Elliot is at nine. You're right. Tishana? I can at least trade for the orc, so... Yeah, but if you have to trade, Dahlia and Hexcatcher. So Hexcatcher makes the mutable <laughs> at 3 3. That would now trade with the Orc. Oh, he's fast. He's fast. And he really wants that clock equity there. 
Uh, add mana. Oh my god, what's that? Khan. Okay. Yeah, I think you're fine with Karn resolving. Counter the activated ability, put a 3-2 into play so you can finish off the Karn on your own turn now that Hugo is down to zero cards in hand. Yeah, kill Karn, one to you probably, or maybe even both to face, although that's risky. You've got force, force actually in hand. I think you crack Islet, try to draw maybe the Fairy, because the Fairy can be activated multiple times to remove the stun counter. So in this spot, it basically untaps immediately, right? You just tap out for it, untap. I think it untaps. I don't think it removes the stun counter. Uh, it untaps, which removes stun counters. The process of untapping does it, basically. Right, right, right. But yeah, it technically untaps. Oh, actually this happens. Okay, that's cool. Uh, called it. Called it. And so now... Uh, okay. Leyline. That does not affect the board at the moment. I Whoa. think you're, you're, you're more than happy to let that one resolve. Keep your force of negation. Elliot, this is not as... Uh, we're, we're not trying to speed up the gameplay. This is uh, this is what is happening uh, over there right now. Yeah, and he's got subtlety as well. No, yeah. he, he has to speed... No. I think I think he's fine. I, I think he's fine if he tries to finish the game with what he has, like the seven power of creatures already. He's got one more attack step and then the extra round, right? Extra turns. So that's that should be that should be easy. With force in hand, subtlety in hand, I think he's perfectly fine now. <laughs> this really feels like somebody clicked on the four yeah. X speed button. <laughs> no, no, Elliot's just trying to play fast. Uh, unfortunately for Hugo, it just draws a couple lands in a row, but uh, I think this was just a correct way for Elliot to approach the uh, the matchup after, you know, the first couple of games, just realizing I don't want to fight the aggressive war. I don't want to try to pressure my opponent as much as possible. I just want to play the good value cards and make sure that Karn and the One Ring don't resolve. And, and if they don't, well, then you're just going to be stuck with a bunch of removal unable to really do anything. And this attack, I think, is exactly lethal, right? 3-3-3-1. Three, 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 That's exactly lethal for 10. So, Elliot, he's holding up Force of Negation. The moment he untaps and goes to combat, this should be lethal. Although, there might be life total discrepancy, it seems. What is something Google can draw to get out of this? Uh, I'm not sure if, I think Elliot's down to one card. Let's say he has a land in hand. So if you're, if you're Hugo, you have to try to play through outs, right? Uh, so you have to think of, obviously he doesn't have any cards, doesn't really have any, any decisions to yeah. make, uh, but you're still, you should be still thinking about, okay, what can I draw? You know, what can happen? So with double coffers, is there a card you can draw into like a walking ballista? Like, would that be enough to... The one ring as a temporary measure. Oh yeah, the one ring obviously. Yeah, that that just buys you a turn at least. Yeah, because you can go ring, maybe maybe top deck shieldred, and then shieldred ring. Draw a card. Yeah, and it's actually ring, a winning yeah. strategy. Um, yeah, players double checking. No, this discrepancy could be important because if U Hugo is not at ten, then the attack isn't lethal. So that that that's a big yeah. difference. Depending on how much mana he exactly has access to, a big march could buy him some extra time. Yeah, double checking the graveyard and everything. Yeah, counting. Okay, so we're double checking everything to make sure that everything is in line. This is why we have judges at the feature match area, so we can work this out. Uh, we always suggest that if there is any discrepancy or you think something happened, but it maybe it didn't, maybe it did, just call the judge and get it resolved fair and square. This is exactly why they are there. They are there to help you solve these types of issues. Yeah, so we will see if they are able to come to an agreement on what actually happened. I think we, the time may have been called, but I think there are still at least five more turns after this. So 
as soon as we are able to fin to figure out exactly the the life total situation, uh, I think Elliot just needs to tap his creatures uh, a couple I... times. There's a subtlety in hand. I think that was a force of negation yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay, we're so. back. Okay. <laughs> That was, yeah. All right, so they figured out exactly what the life level was. Elliot untapped, tapped, tapped all the creatures and won the game. Won the